Good morning, Faith family. It's Friday. Congratulations, you made it to the end of the work week. Finish well. We're coming to the conclusion of our focus in Luke chapter 9 today with a verse that, you know, it almost kind of seems out of place. When we look at verse 27, uh, which I guess to a degree maybe verse 26 did as well, but it fit in the whole genre of, you know, putting Christ first. And today he does as well when we begin to understand it correctly in the context. So verse 27 says, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now, as you might imagine, that verse has opened up all sorts of understandings. Uh, I think I was looking earlier, no less than eight different understandings of what that phrase, what's the implication of this statement. Um, because the key to understanding it is the, the full verse itself. Because there are some who said, well, that's talking about the end, you know, the second coming of Christ. Uh, the problem with that is he says that there are some of you standing here who would not taste death. So that would mean that somehow they were able to overcome death for that length of period of time. So we know that can't be right. Uh, and there's multiple other uh, interpretations of what that verse means. Um, one key that may help us unlock that understanding is if we put it back into the larger context of chapter 9. Because in the very next statement, it says eight days later, And it talks about how Jesus took Peter, James, and John. He went up on the mountain, and there he revealed his glory. He unveiled himself to them. You remember they saw Moses and Elijah also? And then they heard the voice, the voice of God declaring Jesus, my son, whom I'm well pleased, uh, that causing them to to go prostrate, you know, to cast themselves down, face down, uh, fearing the presence of God being there. Of course, Jesus was fully unveiled. They were seeing the glory of God. So in one sense, that would be correct to see that application because they are seeing the kingdom of God in terms of the revelation of who God is and the glory of Christ. Um, but I think there's also more to that. I don't know that we have to really force it into that single context. Because when we think about the kingdom of God, we're talking about the rulership of God. We're talking about the reign of Christ. And um, that really comes ultimately in the second coming. But like I said... Because he says here, you will not taste death. That that you know that automatically discounts that one. So we got to focus on something that's going to happen within the lifetime of the standing here. And for me, and I think about it. That's to me, that's got to be a reference to, you know, the 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 death on the cross, the burial, the resurrection, the key tense, the gospel. Um, those aspects, because that's where we see the kingdom of God displayed in the fact that death has ruled and reigned for thousands and thousands of years. Now, through Christ, death has been defeated because the grave could not hold him. He came back to life. But it can also include, for me, the, the spread, or it can also include the spread of the gospel, the church being born. That through the church, we really begin to see the picture of You know, what is to come in the fulfillment of the ultimate kingdom, the second coming of Christ. And so it's the idea of the rulership. It's the idea of submission. It's the idea of God being glorified above all other. And of course, that would involve the coming of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit being that presence of God in the heart of believers, testifying with us that we are a child of God, comforting us uh, in terms of still remaining in this world, convicting us concerning sin, counseling us for truth and righteousness. So, you know, for me, I, I look at all of the explanations. Like I said, there were at least eight different ones that I saw. And, and I don't, don't know that the, the text is forcing us to pick just one. Now, I think that we can see this verse and the, the truth it's revealing in the context of chapter 9. And like I said, verses 28 and following. But I think we can also see the fulfillment of this verse in terms of, you know, the the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and the spread of the church. All that being fulfilled because in all of that, we see the rule of Christ, the reign of Christ, the revelation of God brought to the forefront. Which brings us to the question that our writer asks, how does Jesus rule in your life? How is Jesus, how, how is the kingdom being revealed in your life? Because that shows in our submission and in our obedience to Christ. And then lastly, what areas will you commit and will you surrender to him? And that's important because we all know there are strongholds in our life. There are attitudes that we're continuing to, to demonstrate. There are unconfessed sins that we're holding on to. There are feelings of resentment and unforgiveness that we're harboring. All of that is in contrast to the will of God and the very nature of Christ. We need to surrender that. There's also areas that we need to surrender in terms of obedience 
to where we can be used of God in, a, in an awesome and mighty way, whether it's in our vocation, in recreation, doesn't matter. So although this verse seems out of place, it, it, it's very much pertinent to the whole idea of surrender. Self-denial, daily cross-bearing, complete, total obedience and fellowship. So I hope this was helpful in understanding this verse, but more importantly, I hope the application of it will make us more like Jesus today than we were yesterday and help us be more faithful in carrying out his work as followers of Christ. Love you folks. I want to remind you that Sunday daylight saving time, daylight saving time ends. And so you want Sunday night, Saturday night when you go to bed, you want to set the clock back one hour. Um, so I tell you, what was that? We always say we gain an hour or whatever. So however that works out for you, but through all these things, we always want to remember whether we're coming here for worship or whether we're going out to a vocation, to education or recreation, doesn't matter. We always want to live sin.